Good morning. Morning. I'm Zachary Schumann. <laughs> I'm interviewing David Hostetler. Uh huh. Start at the beginning. Okay. When did when did you arrive at Yavapai College? Okay. How how did you get here? Uh, I um, came to work here in 1972. I had uh, just finished my PhD at Syracuse uh, and uh, in English. And at that time, the bottom dropped out of the market for English PhDs around the country, and uh, so interviews were hard to come by. Although I did, I, I had a few, and and uh, they might have panned out. But uh, um, we had lived in Arizona before in Phoenix. I taught at Alhambra High School, and I had heard about this little community college that was opening in Prescott uh, that uh, hadn't uh, that most people didn't know about. And so I just sent a blind letter asking if there was an English job. And they didn't know how to advertise at the time. And so they didn't have any applicants, but they had an English job. And so I came, and uh, uh, I, was, I was hired. And uh, I brought with me a brochure that I'd made of my wife teaching uh, kindergarten kids. And she was teaching some, some real little hard cases in Syracuse. They, uh, they were ghetto kids, uh, real hard lives, uh, uh, violent, uh, just a, a real tough background. And uh, she just loved them into learning. And wow. so we took a lot of pictures and, and made up a brochure. And I took it over to the public school uh, uh, superintendent's office and uh, showed it to him. And uh, uh, the, the assistant superintendent was actually doing the hiring. He said he'd never done this before, but he was going to hire this person sight unseen. And so I went home with two jobs from that, uh, from that trip. And uh, uh, from Syracuse, why, Arizona looks really good. It's, it's uh, dark and snowy and rainy, <laughs> and we really want to get back to the West. And so this was a big opportunity for us. So that's, uh, that's how I, I came. I know I've, I've got a little background on mm -hmm. you. I know you've ended up doing a, a whole lot here other than English teaching, and yeah. So how did how did that progress? How did you end up staying here yeah. so long? Well, um, a few months into the job, I became English department chairman by default. <laughs> I, the, I was the junior member of the department, and so they made me be the chairman. <laughs> 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 and uh, after the uh, uh, another year, um, sort of the same way, I I got to be uh, chairman of the liberal arts division. And uh, in that role, I, I had a lot of direct contact with the Dean of Instruction. And I decided I could do that job better than he could. And so uh, uh, after a couple of years, why, he became the president. And I thought, well, what the heck? I, <laughs> so uh, I applied. And uh, all the qualified candidates turned the job down. <laughs> so they were, they were left with me. And uh, that, that job, the title mainly changed, and I, I became uh, academic vice president and then the vice president uh, until 83 or so. So there was about a 10-year period there, eight or 10 years, when I was chief academic officer, uh, at which time I, uh, I thought I wanted to be college president. And the closer I got, <laughs> to that being a reality, uh, the less attractive it was. I, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I decided that I, I was more interested in education than in public relations. And a college president is a public relations person. That's what he does. Uh, and I wanted to be closer to, to the learning process than that. And about that time, the... Uh, instructor who was teaching interdisciplinary humanities uh, decided to retire. And so I thought, well, you know, do I want to stay on track and be an administrator, or would I, would I rather think about what's on the mind of the board member or what's on the mind of Aristotle? <laughs> and, <laughs> and Aristotle and Rembrandt and Shakespeare won. So I, so, uh, I, I sort of reassigned myself to that job. and. Uh, uh, a year or two later, I picked up the uh, directorship of the you know, honors program, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I had something to do with starting it from the, the administrative side. Uh, How did that get going? 
Uh, that was Jim Pence. Um, he was an English instructor who um, uh, really came up with this idea, and it, it was it was um, an idea that I I thought was just dead on, and I so I kind of climbed on his bandwagon and, and uh, tried to help him make it happen. Uh, the idea was that uh, in a community college, it's a good idea to have a um, a mix of students. And we knew, of course, there were going to be a lot of occupational students, and and there were going to be a lot of developmental students, and uh, all kinds of people. But um, faculty, the faculty perception was that the, the mix was missing really bright students. And so we started it as a summer program, um, recruited some high school students, scholarship them, put them up in dorms, uh, and uh, taught uh, some summer summer school classes for them and then enriched that with some field trips and picnics and things like that with the idea that uh, uh, we would then uh, encourage them to enroll and become full-time Yavapai students after they graduated and it was a good program it did good things but it didn't attract the, <laughs> the bright high school kids they uh, tended to say thank you very much now we're going off to wherever we're going uh, and so uh, after two or three years, why we refined it, uh, redefined it, and uh, we kept that that um, goal of attracting good high school graduates, uh, because we we really did think that uh, you need you need some bright, thoughtful people in the mix, and uh, um, and I think it's worked out that way. I I've, I've been really happy with the uh, uh, what the the program has been able to achieve. But after a few years, there was a kind of an equity concern. I, why are we doing this only for high school graduates? What about the, the uh, returning student, the re-entry student, the um, uh, student who came here on his own or her own and, and is doing very well? And why should they be denied? So uh, we opened it up a little farther. And then, well, what about the really campus students? And so. Yeah, well, we sweep some of those folks into the fold, and uh, um, we uh, uh, turned the uh, what had been a uh, a summer field trip experience into a spring break uh, uh, more extended experience, and we went uh, usually to Los Angeles or San Francisco or maybe San Diego. And did plays and concerts and uh, museums and things like that. Um, I thought about Washington D.C. and New York, and then I started getting scared. <laughs> and uh, uh, fortunately, the people who took over the program after I left were braver than I. And so, uh, you, uh, you get Europe and you know some some really neat things. And this year we got New York. And you got New York this year, did you? Great. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> um, but that's kind of how it came about. Um, I did that for, I don't, know, I don't know, 10 years or so. I was doing it when I retired in 94. Cool. Yeah. What else have you done while you've been here? What have, what have those jobs involved in terms of, I mean, when you were administrative, what, uh -huh. what did you see then? Um, I'll try. I'll try not to theorize too much. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, let me let me put it in terms of an anecdote. I, I uh, uh, my first or second year here, uh, there was a, uh, a a newly formed organization of chief academic officers, usually deans or vice presidents, and registrars of all the community colleges and universities in Arizona. Mm -hmm. uh, they called it Higher Education Coordinating Council, HEC. <laughs> and, uh, and it was uh, it was really the first uh, articulation group in the state. Uh, 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 college presidents had no forum for talking to each other. Uh, board members didn't have any forum for talking to each other. Students. Uh, uh, financial aid people, you know, they, they, there was just no uh, no line of communication. 
and this group was originally formed uh, to concern itself with transfer of credits to to try to make sure that that was as smooth as possible. And they had uh, just succeeded in publishing a document they called the Course Equivalency Guide. Uh, it uh, and it purported to list all the courses at all the community colleges and universities and show what they were equivalent to. Uh, and uh, the um, uh, theoretically, if a student is planning to transfer, why you know he can take uh, English 101 at Yavapai and know that it's equivalent to whatever it's equivalent to at ASU or or uh, NAU or U of A or Phoenix College, you know, for that matter. And uh, as long as you're talking about English 101, that works real well. Uh, right. But when you get to courses that uh, may have different names, different numbers, slightly different content, things get a little more sticky. And um, the, um, the university faculty, faculties tend to be pretty jealous of transfer credit. Um, they're not quite sure what's going on off there in Cottonwood, Arizona. What, what, what are these people doing in Yuma? You know, they purport to be teaching this class, but how do we know what they're really getting? And they didn't like the notion of any guaranteed equivalency. Um, but the registrars and uh, uh, deans of instruction had hammered together a kind of a tenuous consensus. The, the people who actually deal directly with that's them, right, wringing their hair. That's <laughs> right, and of course there were all kinds of horror stories right. about the, the the student who tries to transfer, you know, a perfectly good credit, and and somebody won't take it, and right. and there were complaints to legislators about that. You know, hey, we're paying for English 101 for this student at Yavapai College. Why don't we have to pay again when he takes it over at ASU? Uh, Taxpayers are not going to stand for that. And, and so there was, you know, there was some leverage. But uh, I remember uh, uh, um, walking into a meeting where there was a professor from NAU who um, was insisting, he was the NAU's representative, that this is information only. It is not binding. Universities are not bound by anything. And uh, someone asked him, no, I, mean, I guess it was I. <laughs> I asked him, well, what, what are you going to do if uh, one of my students comes to NAU and he's taken my class in American literature? And uh, he said, oh, We'd probably accept it. I'd, I'd probably want to sit him down, and just ask him a few questions, and as long as he he um, you know had a pretty good understanding, and and I thought that he had um, mastered a good bit of what we would be teaching in American Lit at at NAU, I'd probably count the credit. And I remember exploding. I said, "The hell you will!" <laughs> and, and we went on from there. And, and other people intervened. Uh, but the but the real question is: is is that equivalency guide binding or not? Does the the receiving institution uh, what rights does it have to sit in judgment on the uh, the the credits that are being transferred? Um, and. Uh, uh, Part of that was that I, I both as a, as, a, as a faculty member and an administrator, uh, I was really concerned at getting students everything that was due. But the other side of that coin is uh, coming home and making sure that the product that the student was taking to wherever he wanted to take was a really good product. And I, um, I, I always had a kind of a mission. Um, it, 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 bothers me a whole lot to hear uh, community colleges um, referred to or thought of as the, the uh, college of last resort. Can't get into a good school, you can always go to the community college. Uh, can't find anything else to go, no, go to the community college. Uh, and as, as if that's, that's where 
uh, you go to mark time and, and the people who go there are the ones who can't do anything else. And that applies to faculty as well as students. What are you teaching at community college for? You're, you're a bright guy. You could make it in the university. Well, I, I'm in a community college because I, I chose that. I, and, I, and I really did. I, I had some other options. But um, I wanted to teach. I, and that was a choice. And I wanted to teach uh, students who um, uh, if they were going to make it in life, they were going to make it on merit. Uh, and that tends to be the community college student. Uh, they they tend not to uh, um, have uh, what are they called uh, heritage uh, rights at the prestige schools where you go because your family has always gone there and they endowed right. a building and you know things like this. Um, uh, and and it's always been a kind of an, a mission of mine that. Um, if anything second rate is going to happen at my college, it's going to be over my dead body. <laughs> I, I, I believe in quality, and uh, I think that uh, the worst thing you can do to a community college student is the, um, uh, the, the prejudice of diminished expectations. Yeah, well, oh, you know, we're just a community college, you know. So, in terms of our expectations and standards, by uh, you know, uh, now if we were a real college, right, here's what we'd be doing. Oh uh, no, 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 no. We're a real college, and uh, um, I think you've succeeded. I and think so. There's the small class sizes are mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. And I mean, I'm in the nursing program. I've got. Quite a few classmates who have bachelors already. Is that right? Other from four-year schools all over the place. I have a classmate. One of my friends in my program has a bachelor's in neuropharmacology or something. Oh my goodness! At UC Santa Barbara, but he's here because the nursing program has a very good reputation. And That's it's, exactly it's that. It's a good program. It's a good school, and he wants to go into that profession, so he's here. Excellent. Yeah. That's that's uh, and you know I, I there are a whole lot of other people who are on that same mission, which yeah. I think is what makes you have a pie what it is today. Um, and yes, <laughs> that's, just, that's just great. That's uh, uh, after I retired, I taught uh, NAU extension classes for a while, and during breaks and before and after class, why students would stand around, you know, and they're swapping stories. And, and I generally tried not to say very much and, you know, just listen and see what's going on. But a lot of what was going on was um, um, comparing uh, what are we getting from Yavapai, what are we getting from NAU, uh, what did we get from some other place that we went to. And in those kinds of conversations, Yavapai tended to come up real, real strong. i got another story about that. I, uh, after I, I left the administration, I went back to teaching. Uh, I was walking across the campus one day. It was uh, in fall. It was oh, about the time of student orientation. And um, when I was when I was a vice president, I uh, well through heck largely, uh, I got to know all the the uh, uh, academic officers and registrars and a lot of the college presidents around the state. So I. That was when I thought I wanted to be a president, so I was networking. <laughs> and uh, uh, I was walking across the campus, and I bumped into a, a, an old friend who was the president of another community college in Arizona. And I said, hi, how are you? what you doing? What, what brings you here? And I thought he was probably here for some kind of meeting. And he looked a little shamefaced. He said, well, he said, I really, I really need for you not to make this public. He said, but I'm here because uh, I'm enrolling my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, I, 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 I'm not going to sell out my own school and my faculty and, and my college. But when it comes to your own daughter, you want her to go someplace or you're really sure she's going to get the real deal. And I thought that was about the best compliment <laughs> I had ever heard. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, uh, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that, that it's, it is what it is. Uh, and 
Uh, I think the honors program has had something to do with it. I think a focus on on good students and good faculty and and uh, uh, high standards and finding good ways to meet those standards. I, you know, you can talk about setting high standards, but that doesn't do you any good unless, unless you can actually get people. That's <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. And uh, I I've, I've really felt good about uh, yeah probably being able to do that. Cool. Uh, I don't want to wander too far afield into the politics of higher education in Arizona, but um, uh, as I mentioned before, um, university faculty tend to be pretty sensitive about incoming transfer students mm -hmm. for some ideological reasons. Mm -hmm. They're not sure that these are well-educated people. And for some very practical reasons, if you take a class at Yavapai, that means you're not going to take it at the university. Okay. And that's enrollments, and enrollments mean uh, job security and budget, and uh, so um, uh, one of the things we observed was uh, what uh, what I called upper division creep. Uh, if um, Yavapai is teaching a course in such and such, and the university faculty gets worried about that. Well, they're all going to take it at the community college. And this can happen particularly in a place like Maricopa County where, you know, you really can go to a community college and you've got a choice. You can take right. uh, your gen ed. There's both in the same place. That's right. And it's cheaper one place than the other. So how do you protect your turf? If you're a university faculty, you renumber the class. You make it a junior level class, and obviously no sophomore level class is equivalent to a junior level class. And so you can go ahead and take that sophomore class at uh, uh, Yavapai or Glendale or wherever. Uh, but when you come here, you're going to have to take that junior level class or senior level or something like that. And of course, we'll justify that by rearranging the content. Uh, and so upper division creep was one of the, the things we were struggling with. Um, our, um, our tool, the, the HEX tool, Higher Education Coordinating Council tool, was this course equivalency guide. And as, as I said, if you're talking about English 101 or college algebra, it's pretty much across the board. Everybody's doing that. Uh, what do you do? with a nursing student uh, who, uh, whose curriculum may not look exactly like the nursing curriculum uh, at a university, or a, uh, well, uh, the, the first fix for that was to say, okay, we're, talk we're not talking, the course equivalency guide is not going to talk about occupational programs. Okay. Those are, by definition, all standalone. We're not going to worry about accounting classes. We're not going to worry about automotive technology or agribusiness or nursing or any of that stuff. Because most of those, a lot of those have their own, a lot of those require licensure once you get That's out. right. So everything is basically just based right. off of yeah. what gets you to that licensure. Yeah. So yeah. it can be fairly clear cut within itself. Sure, sure. Uh, and, um, uh, but that leaves Jim Ed. And uh, uh, the, the sequence of courses that I was teaching, uh, humanities, uh, well, one and two, uh, uh, when I inherited the, them, they were uh, two four-credit courses, one for first semester, one for second semester. And when originally conceived, I guess at the University of Arizona, this was to be it was to serve the function that now is served, I guess, by the capstone classes. This is the place where every student who graduates from U of A, if he ever meets up with any other student from U of A and they're looking for something to talk about, they can talk about arts and ideas because they all took that class. This is the common experience of everyone. And arts and ideas of Western man was uh, uh, served that purpose at Yavapai uh, when I took it over. Um, problem is that at the three state universities, this sequence of two four credit classes had undergone um, um, gen ed reform. 
And at one of them, it morphed itself into three three credit classes. At another, it was two three credit classes. And at one of them kept the four and four pattern, but changed the content. So where are my classes going to transfer? They're not equivalent any place. They uh, and and that doesn't seem right. Uh, so what are we going to do about that? Um, and uh, for years, the answer was uh, give the student somebody's name and phone number when he goes to whatever university, tell him call this person, he'll fix it for you. Well, that's no way to do business. That's, you know, uh, that's, that's sort of old boy politics. And, and uh, so that, that bothered me a lot. But... Um, Toying with people's futures. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it, if it, this guy likes you. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It doesn't matter what you know, it's who you know. Show up with a cake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so I was, I was rather proud. Um, uh, Ken Meyer, who uh, uh, taught, uh, well, he was a uh, uh, liberal arts division chair, and he taught history, and, and he was acting chief academic officer for a few years. Uh, uh, he's now in California as a, I guess, a vice president at a community college there. But uh, he and I hatched this idea that said um, what we need is a, something better than equivalency, a better idea. And the better idea uh, can takes form from I will say something like um, the science requirement for a, for a degree, and in a in a very specific concentrated area like nursing, you know you better not take geology for your for your for your science requirement. I mean you know you know what you've got to do, uh, but for a lot of students, they just need a science credit, and it can be geology or biology, it can be botany, zoology, chemistry, you know, just need a science credit. Well, if you can meet the science requirement from any of those areas, what's the purpose of the science requirement? Why do we want to do that? And the answer, of course, is that as far as gen ed is concerned, not as far as the major is concerned, as far as gen ed is concerned, we think there are values that you learn in a lab class. Uh, and we could list what some of those are. And we don't care whether you achieve those values with geology or, or botany. It's the values that count. And our idea was, why not apply that to the whole gen ed curriculum? Right. Why worry that's about... That's a good example of things that are clearly not equivalent. That's really there's right. There's something there. There's something in common. And that's true for social sciences. It, it's really true for, for everything in gen ed. And so our idea was, let's quit worrying about whether my four-credit humanities class is equivalent or not. It's humanities, for goodness sake. And it pursues the values of humanities. And as long as it pursues those values, it ought to be transferable for humanities credit. Uh, and that became the foundation, that, that, that kind of thinking. We sold it first to a, uh, a bunch of... Um, humanities teachers who then uh, um, forwarded it on up the line to some uh, chief academic officers and registrars. And um, it, it became the foundation for the transfer compacts that exist now. And uh, I, I feel proud of that. It, 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 it took a lot of negotiating, a lot of politicking, a lot of um, empires, uh, being fortified and crumbling walls and being rebuilt and, and egos involved and a, a lot of uh, a lot of <laughs> irrelevant nastiness, but uh, uh, conceptually, uh, that's what underlies the uh, the transfer compacts that now guarantee the uh, the transfer of credits, and it all hatched in a college station wagon. Uh, between here and Phoenix one day when uh, Ken Meyer and I were... Between were, here and Phoenix, how appropriate. <laughs> yeah, right, that's right. That was perfect. Yeah, it sounds like one of your more unique experiences is, is, is having 
gotten your hands deep into both the administrative and the teaching end of things. It was just great. Sometimes politically those are kind of two distinct groups that are butting yeah. heads now and then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, you know. <laughs> um, uh, this may not come up in in some of the oral histories that are um, uh, being taken. Uh, when I arrived in '72, um, the college had a new president. His name was Cal James, and he's kind of the forgotten president in the history of Yavapai College. If you look through archives. Uh, the people who were here a long time, Doreen Daly and Paul Walker and Joe Russo's name will, will crop up because they had a, um, a presidential tenure on the order of 10 years or so. And they left their mark. Uh, the founding president only lasted a couple years and people tended to forget his name. Uh, and his successor was only here for a couple years and, and people tend to forget who that was. But his name was Cal James. Uh, he was from NAU. He um, taught, uh, what's it called? I, I want to say vocational education, but uh, that isn't quite right. He trained uh, teachers of uh, in, in occupational areas. Uh, and um, Yavapai at the time was interested in emphasizing occupational things. And so they hired Cal James to do it. He lasted two years and he went back to NAU. He decided he'd just rather be there than here. But what he brought with him was a model of governance, a, a concept of, of uh, uh, how decisions are going to get made at a community college. And it was a university kind of model. He came from NAU. Uh, he had some ideas about what frustrated him at NAU and he was going to fix them here and so he was very receptive to what we used to call shared governance in which the faculty had a, a lot of influence and that tends to be the case at uh, uh, most universities, certainly most private universities it's the origin of higher education the, 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 uh, the first universities really were communities of faculty. Right. Yeah. They didn't get started by hiring a president. Mm -hmm. They they got together, the first administrator they hired was a treasurer. They got, they got a president <laughs> when the teachers got sick of doing that stuff. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's, yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it was the, the notion of, uh, you know, who's in charge. Well, it was very clear who's in charge. Right. <laughs> these, are, these, are, these are scholars. They're, right. it's, uh, and, and a lot of colleges are, are like that. Um, a competing model says is, is sort of the, the private sector model that says that uh, there's a boss and he hires people and, and, and as long as it's a small organization he can do everything himself you, know, you think of a small small business person an entrepreneur, mom and pop business they can do everything themselves hands on but as they get bigger they have to hire people who become extensions of them but the idea that these extensions are independent and they make decisions? No, no, no. The, 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 the boss is the boss. The boss may be right, the boss may be wrong, but the boss is always the boss. Uh, and so you've got these two competing models. One's a bottoms up and one's a top down. And they, they collided at Yavapai College. And Cal James uh, and uh, some faculty members who, who uh, very much shared his ideas, um, uh, worked out a, a governance system in which the faculty had a lot of influence. Um, he left after a couple years. His successor, Joe Russo, whom I worked for, said, um, if I had my druthers, uh, I would be an arbitrary son of a bitch. But as long as this shared governance is producing good results, hey, let's go with it. And so we did. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. It meant that, that there was a lot of conflict at a pretty low level in the organization. There were a lot of committees where ideas got hammered out. And, and in those committees, 
you know, we, uh, and and I was on all of them. I, as the chief academic officer, I sat on probably eight or ten standing committees, and we'd fight and we'd argue, and but that's where the fighting took place. And once we reached agreement, it was a pretty well wrung out idea, and uh, I would sell it on up the line and. Faculty members would sell it on out into the into the faculty, and gee, there were good ideas. We 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 came up with a lot of neat stuff. Gen Ed reform being one of them. But uh, um, at the end of Joe Russo's tenure, there began to be well, nationally, this is the case. Uh, they, there there's a lot more emphasis now on um, decision makers making decisions. And when, when was that? When oh, in the. Um, he retired in about 83, 84. Uh, and uh, the, the mood, my sense, and I, 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 don't, I, I don't claim to be really on top of this in any detailed way, but my sense of the mood of the, the uh, taxpayers is that they want to hold a president accountable for what happens in the college. And they don't want him hiding behind committees and consensus. They want him to, to. Um, they want to tell him what to do, and they want him to delegate it and get it done. Um, and um, that model at Yavapai College, um, uh, that that's the model that the Yavapai's board and administration. Uh, says they subscribe to. They call it um, policy governance. If you go to board meetings, you probably hear them talk about policy governance. And that's, that's the essence of it. It says the college belongs to its owners. The owners make the decisions. The way they do that is they elect board members. Owners are the taxpayers. They elect the board members. The board members tell the president what to do, and the president Farms out, delegates, subdelegates, and gets it done. Uh, and um, I think that's um, that's the dominant model for community colleges and in, in many four-year schools. Uh, I don't like it. I I uh, uh, in the first place, it's boy, am I rambling? Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, in the first place, it's it's based on a a wrong assumption about who owns the college um, because when your average student age is, how high is it now at Yavapai, 30 well, something? I'm, I just turned 26 mm -hmm. and I'm one of the youngsters at least in the nursing program. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, to make a distinction between the student and the taxpayer, not at a community college, right. the taxpayers the taxpayers are the students, and and for goodness sake, look at look at all the retirees taking classes, and, you know. So uh, uh, in the first place, uh, it's it's that dichotomy between the people who own the college and and the students who don't own it. Uh, in a community college, that's wrong. Uh, in addition to tuition and fees, uh, a lot of the students are tax-paying people, uh, whether. Whether it's property taxes uh, or other kinds of taxes, in the second place, even if that were not true, it's a very useful fiction to say, as as we used to say, that um, what comes first is the student. Um, under policy governance, what comes first is the community. Uh, the community college is here to serve the community. And very often, that's not much different from saying the community college is here to serve the student. Because you can do both. Uh, and a nursing program is probably a pretty good example. Uh, students want jobs as nurses. The community needs nurses. You run a good nursing program, you serve the need of the student, and you serve the need of the community. And it works. And so 
you know, you don't you don't worry about why it works. Is it because we're here for the community or the student? Well, there's no there's no particular conflict there, but sometimes there is. Um, what if the student wants to be an MD instead of a nurse? Uh, what if the student aspires to um, goals for which a bachelor's or a master's or a doctorate is necessary? How are we meeting the need of that student? Well, um, well, let me let me no, that, um, um, I think that um, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm curious. Okay, <laughs> well, more theory. Uh, there was in the 70s mm -hmm. a, a Harvard professor whose name I don't remember who uh, wrote some books and made some speeches and I, I attended a conference and I heard him talk and I read his books and, uh, and he was proposing a Marxist way of looking at community colleges yeah. uh, and uh, you know it, 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 uh, I don't know if he used the word proletariat or not, but I, it's what he was talking about. And he said that community colleges are the tool of the capitalist class, and they're an instrument for keeping down and manipulating the proletariat. And while the capitalist class is sending its sons and daughters, mostly sons, to elite colleges so that they can then become a part of the power elite. They network, they join Skull and Bones at Yale and become presidents of the United States. They, you know, they become cabinet members, heads of corporations, presidents of this and that, and they sit on corporate boards. And, and that's what the capitalists do. And the, and the entry point for that world is the prestige college and university. And that doesn't mean a state university, that means the prestige university, the, the Ivy Leagues and the Stanfords and Berkeleys and places like that. Uh, well, how do you make sure that the proletariat doesn't break into that world? Well, you cool them out. You give them a place to go. You give them the illusion of uh, success. You get them to aspire to, uh, he didn't use this number, but today it would be, you know, you get them to aspire to a um, uh, $40,000 salary so that they're not, so that they're not going to, no matter how bright they are, they, uh, they get cooled out, their ambitions get cooled out, they're, they, they, they enter a world of, of diminished expectations and that's how you're going to develop this pool of well-trained um, workers who are going to be more or less satisfied with proletarian wages and whose ambitions will tend to be fifty thousand dollars instead of forty but they, they, they are alienated completely from the, the um, the elite, the, the, the sons and daughters of the elite are insulated. Well, that became part of my crusade. Uh, you know, you may send your sons and daughters someplace to get a really good course in arts and ideas, but it's not going to be any better than you're going to get it. You have a Pike College, and I'm going to see to that. Um, the, um, um, in my view, policy governance now, I, at, at the time, when I heard that speech, uh, the, the first time, uh, the hair just went up in the back of my neck. I, what do you mean talking about the community college as an instrument of the capitalist class? I mean, this, this is the instrument of upward mobility, if it's anything. And the more I thought about it, I said, huh, boy, maybe the guy's got a point. And so I'm going to make it my cause to... to um, provide my students and the students that you have at Pi College as well as I can whatever it's going to take to compete in any environment where they want to go and if they they want to go for a bachelor's or a master's or whatever or if they don't need another degree they they 
got some other ideas and, and ways to become influential if they want to be. I want them to do it. Not that they need to. I, 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 um, what I really want is for people to have choices. And in this particular model, the community college cools you out, takes away even your... The, the, this government and governance model? Yeah. Saying? Uh, I think that uh, policy governance tends to do that. Uh, if you phrase it in, in, in Marxist terms, uh, well, I, I guess I'm glad I'm talking to a nursing student. <laughs> uh, whose interest is it in to have a very large pool of very well-trained nurses in Yavapai County, Arizona? If that goal were achieved, what would happen to the wages of those people? If there were a very large, you know. I've, I've, I've worked previously as a massage therapist up in the Northwest where uh -huh. there are way too many massage therapists. There you I go. Know exactly where you're going with that. There you go. There you go. Now, you know, that's not likely to happen in the nursing profession. That's, no. that's you know, right? We're a long, long way from that. And most of the nurses probably wouldn't mind if it did. That's right. But. That's right. Uh, compare that with uh, the, uh, the series that's been running in the Courier this last week or so about uh, uh, shortage of MDs. Uh, well, uh, what, what's happened is that, uh, you know, there, there is a shortage. You know, people who come into Prescott can't get doctors. They, you know, they want a, a, a primary care physician and they hunt around and hunt around and they just can't find them. Uh, and uh, I don't want to say that the Marxist spin on that would be, well, of course, it's a plot. How are you going to keep wages in, uh, of uh, uh, this uh, professional class high? Make sure there are very few of them. How do you do that? American Medical Association. You know, don't accredit very many of those. Don't accredit too many medical schools. Now, that's not what's happened. But that would be the, the, the Marxist spin. And for me, there's, that, that's far from the whole story. And it's, it's a distortion of reality, but it's got that much truth. And uh, as we were talking about a while ago, I think that one of the things I like about Yavapai College is, uh, A, that it, that it does equip people to make different choices. It uh, doesn't say there's anything wrong with doing whatever you want to do. But if you want to do something different, you're equipped to do it, and you know that the option is there. I, I remember one time we were talking about um, uh, offering... Uh, among other things, I, I was responsible for extension classes. And uh, we were talking about, well, what kinds of classes would we put in extension locations? What about Seligman, uh, Ash Fork, uh, uh, Black Canyon City? And somebody said, well, you know, maybe some secretarial classes in Seligman, uh, uh, things like that. And one of the people in the room said, where would a student in Seligman, where would a person in Seligman have any idea what a secretary does? Where would you find secretaries in Seligman? Yeah? And there aren't any. You know, uh, the person, the person growing up in Selig for, for the person growing up in Seligman, secretary isn't a realistic career choice. It's just not. You know, it, well, it's yeah, it is. You know, they know there are such things as secretaries, but they don't know any. Uh, and, and it might not be a good choice for somebody who's really hoping to stay there. That's right. That that's really so. The focus. That's right. The satellite school that's there so that they can stay there. That's right. <laughs> that's right. And so we didn't do that. <laughs> uh, oh, bring me back to reality. I've been I've been <laughs> philosophizing and theorizing. What would be the most meaningful, personally touching? experience you've had with the Alify College? Um, that's pretty easy. Uh, since, since I was director of the honors program, uh, that meant that I got a, a disproportional exposure to bright people. <laughs> and uh, very often one of, uh, one of them would end up as the commencement speaker. And uh, when they talk about uh, 
you know, our experiences at Yaddle Pie College, every once in a while somebody would throw in my name as somebody that they had uh, particularly uh, valued. Uh, and uh, boy, that is as good as it gets. That is just, uh, that, that is so fine. It's just so fine. Um, when I retired, um, I also got a, 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 another award. Uh, well, I, I retired at the end of a, a turbulent presidency of Paul Walker. Uh, he was fired after a faculty vote of no confidence. A lot of headlines, a lot of public meetings, a lot of anger. A lot of back and forth about who's in charge, I would guess. Well, yes, that's, that's really right. That really, that was a big part of it. Um, and when the dust had settled, uh, Paul was fired. Uh, one board member retired on advice of his physician. He said his heart couldn't take this anymore. <laughs> One left because it was bad for business. Too many people were too angry, and uh, it was it was hurting his income. Uh, one of them was re um, forcibly removed uh, by uh, a lawsuit. Uh, the president was gone, uh, and uh, faculty a faculty vote of no confidence uh, touched it all off. A lot of other things erupted in the community after that. But uh, uh, Jim filled to overflowing with angry people at board meetings, uh, read headlines in the courier. Uh, just, uh, it, it, was, it was a nasty, nasty thing. So that was in 94? That was in 80, 94, yes. Uh, 93, that was in 93. Uh, my role, when I, when I uh, left administration, I went back to faculty, I uh, said I will, I will do my duty, I will serve on a couple of committees, but I will not chair a committee, and I will not sit on faculty senate, and I will not serve as an officer of the faculty association, because if I wanted to be political, I would have stayed in a place where I could have been successfully political and had a lot more influence, so I'm not going to do that. Well. Uh, in 93, uh, the vice president of the faculty association turned up with an announcement. His doctor told him he couldn't do that and he'd have to be replaced. And somebody nominated me and I thought, oh, shoot, the vice president doesn't do anything. Oh, all right, what the heck, I'll do it. Well, uh, in January of 93, the... Uh, as a complete surprise to me, uh, I, one of the junior faculty members said, I move we have a vote of no confidence in the president. And that touched it all off. The president of the faculty association, soon thereafter, called me and said, I just had a session with the president of the college, and it's all yours. <laughs> and, oh. so, and so uh, I was, I was, yeah, <laughs> yeah, doesn't do anything. Do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, uh, I was pretty high profile in all that. And uh, uh, it, uh, 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 well, a, a lot of people involved doing a lot of things. But um, uh, at the end of the year, why, uh, uh, he was gone, and there had been a lot of turnover on the board. And um, in effect, the faculty had won. They would expressed their no-confidence vote, and they, uh, uh, in effect, got their way. But there's a price to be paid. It's uh, uh, um, The new board was concerned that the faculty would think they had gotten their way. And so you, we need to reassert who's in control here. And uh, so one of the ways of doing it was to deny emeritus status to certain faculty members, me being one of them. Uh, emeritus status is, it's all, it's honorary and it doesn't mean anything except it goes after your name. The, in the college catalog, and it, you know, retired faculty are pretty frequently recognized that way. 
well, they were not going to recognize Hostetler that way. <laughs> And so I, I was not, uh, when, when I retired a year later, um, uh, nobody, uh, I, I was not emeritized. Two or three years later I was, I, this sort of things calmed down. But at that commencement, the student speaker referred to me as someone who had um, uh, taught them something useful and valuable. And the faculty president made a special award they created something called the Faculty Hall of Fame. <laughs> and they elected me and uh, Marianne Bamrick they, uh, and Ruth Longfield. There were three people inducted into the Faculty <laughs> Hall of Fame. Now, it lasted one year. There's never been an <laughs> inductee. But it was their way of saying thanks. And uh, I just treasured that. It was, uh, it was wonderful. It, um, I, uh, those... those those are the best times. To, you know, when faculty say thanks and students say thanks. There's just nothing better. Cool. Well, our tape is about to run out. Well, uh, we can go on if you'd like. I think oh, we. I think I've blathered about as much <laughs> as I should. <laughs> That's exactly what they're looking for. So. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Well, Zachary has been good. <laughs>